Discounts and Deals Make no mistake, budgeting is difficult. When you are planning a trip anywhere, one of the first things you do is look at your budget for the trip. Sometimes this can be intimidating, and you are left trying to figure out how to get the most out of your limited funds and resources. This section is designed to help you find ways to stretch those resources and get the best vacation your money can buy. A lot of this will depend on when you go and how long you are going to stay. A week in January is going to be much less expensive than a week in August, especially if you are going into Edinburgh during the military tattoo and festival month. Airfare will be higher during the peak season of June, July, and August, a bit lower on the shoulder season, in March, April, and May, and September, October, and November, and lowest during the winter months, except around Christmas which can be more expensive to travel than in August. While it doesn't vary as much, or as capriciously, higher-end accommodations will also vary based on season. Some may even be closed during the winter months, so be warned and plan ahead. The most important aspect of finding the best deal is research. You must spend some time to find the deals and know enough to realize it's a good deal before buying. This applies to airfare, car rental, accommodation, entrance fees, train tickets, whatever you are looking for. What is a good deal? Like anything, it depends on what you're willing to pay versus how much you really want it. But I can give you some guidelines via my past experiences. Planning One of the best things I would recommend is to visit the Undiscovered Scotland website. It has a fantastic interactive map that helps you to plan out your trip, with blurbs and pictures about all sorts of interesting spots. It shows you how close each is to the other and allows you to plan accordingly. This will cut down on the back and forth driving that you can easily fall victim to, saving on both time and petrol slash gas expenses. There are several discount cards that can help reduce the cost of entering many monuments and properties. Many museums are actually free, by the way. Take advantage of that! The Scottish Heritage Pass, Edinburgh Pass, Historic Scotland Pass, and National Heritage Membership all offer discounted entry into many of Scotland's historic attractions. Do some research. If you plan on visiting five or more of the sites they cover, it may be well worth the cost. Not all historic sites are covered, so do look them up. I find a great way to get a good overview of the cities of Edinburgh and Glasgow, and to travel around the cities, is to get tickets for the hop-on slash hop-off bus which wins through the streets, stopping at various attractions and offering commentary. A good way to find them is to look for the open-top buses. The closed ones are usually for local city travel, not tourists. You do not need to pre-book these tours. Just show up at one of the stops, which are signposted around the city. Your ticket is good for 24 hours, so if you get on the bus at 1 p.m., the last tour out is a pickup tour at 5 p.m., you can get back on the bus first thing in the morning for free and continue sightseeing until 1 p.m., though they may allow you the rest of the day if you get a nice driver. I have done the hop-on slash hop-off bus in many major cities, including London, Edinburgh, Dublin, New York City, and Washington, D.C., and always find it to be entertaining and useful. Also, I recommend the live commentary buses, as the canned ones tend to be less lively and lack humor. Each time I've gone, I manage to get a host who sings for us, not necessarily very well, but with great enthusiasm. Airfare Usually, direct flights are less expensive, but that isn't always the case. Sometimes flying into or from a major hub, such as Newark or London, can help keep the costs down. Sometimes it's the only viable options. For instance, there are no direct flights from my closest airport to Scotland, I always have to fly to a larger airport that handles jets. The last trip, I had to fly from Jacksonville to Atlanta, to Manchester, to Glasgow. Check out the planning section for airfare for more information. I use several tools for this such as Google Flights or Kayak. I also sign up for email alerts from the airlines I might use, such as Delta or American. If you get notification of a great sale, and you know you are going, 
jump on it right away. That deal may be sold out in an hour. I prefer to have control of my travel times, and most airlines require at least two hours layover on international flights for the connection. Anything less in your luggage may not arrive when you do. It is up to your personal level of comfort for chaos how you book your tickets. If you are a student or a veteran, there are websites, such as Student Universe, STA Travel, or Veterans Advantage which can help you with better airfare. Having enough frequent flyer miles with a particular airline, many credit cards allow you to accumulate these, can also either defray or replace the costs of a flight overseas. However, keep in mind many might have blackout periods, and sometimes seats are more difficult to get if you are using miles to obtain them. Some airlines, I know Delta is one, allow you to apply your miles to a portion of the cost, reducing the total, no matter what the seat or flight. Transportation Renting a car is, by far, my highest recommended mode of transportation when traveling in Scotland. However simple this may sound, though, it is fraught with peril and complexity, hidden charges and downright fraud. Please see my ground transportation advice in the previous section for lots of details on how to avoid, or at least minimize, them. Another option is train travel. A Brit Rail Pass may be helpful. However, the trains aren't quite as all-encompassing as traveling by car, and once you get to those hubs, you must find another way to travel around the enchanting countryside. Brit Rail travels between the cities and large towns but will not get you to the smaller destinations. There are actually several options, you could base yourself in that town or village and take daily private tours or a larger organized coach tour, or rent a horse-drawn caravan, cycle or hike, or just visit the town or village in a more relaxed local kind of way. It is all up to your style of travel, your budget, desires, and sometimes your physical limitations. Accommodation while I'm in Scotland, I greatly prefer staying at bed and breakfasts as my accommodation choice. However, sometimes hotels are a better choice, such as the night before flying out of the airport or in Edinburgh, where BNBS aren't as available. BNBS can average 35 to 40 pounds per person sharing per night, PPPN, and include the famous traditional full Scottish breakfast. Specialty BNBS, historic houses, castle BNBS, etc., are usually a bit more expensive. I prefer BNBS but occasionally splurge for a charming, historically significant place or the odd thatched cottage. Keep in mind this is PPPN, and therefore, twice as much for two people in the one room. Single rooms are slightly higher, averaging 40 to 45 pounds per night. Some BNBS have family rooms at a discounted rate per person, perhaps £35 PPPN. Again, it depends on your personal level of comfort and sharing with your traveling companions. I have more information on accommodation in the previous section. If you really want to splurge, you can always spend some time in a castle. Yes, you can find smaller castle accommodations than the five-star hotels. They are few but include some B&B accommodation and self-catering, and there's even a castle hostel. What's the cheapest accommodation while traveling in Scotland? Camping out, of course. It's not my cup of tea, but plenty of people do it, especially if they've a bike or are out hiking the countryside. You could also go for hostels for a great discounted stay. Youth hostels are no longer separate from other hostels, today's difference being average hostels and specialty hostels. In other words, age is no longer a defining factor to using a hostel. Typical hostels are purpose-built accommodation with shared dorms with shared bathrooms. Scottish Youth Hostels Association, or SYHA, is a popular site for booking around the country. Another option, particularly good if you've a large group, is a self-catering house. These are usually standalone houses or cottages, with a varying amount of space, for rent in usually week-long periods, most often from Saturday to Saturday. Sometimes, usually off high season, you can get short breaks of two to three days instead. Sometimes this is an option in the city, as well. 
We rented a two-story flat a block from the Royal Mile in Edinburgh, complete with brick-arched ceilings, four-poster bed and the original 15th-century hardwood floors. It had a vaulted ceiling in the dining room, two bedrooms downstairs, and a small one-bedroom flat above it, they could be rented out separately. The entrance was down on Victoria Street, at the base of the hill Edinburgh Castle sits atop. The upper flat had a door that led out to a terrace, with another stairway leading up to the Royal Mile. Very convenient. There are several places to find self-catering lodges, but I recommend going through a well-known agent, such as Visit Scotland, Embrace Scotland, or Cottages and Castles UK. Food. Food can be an expensive part of your trip, or a very cheap one, depending on your planning and habits. Staying at a B&B can be a big part of this, the enormous breakfast your hosts will provide you will keep you fueled into the afternoon or early evening, if you let it. We often do this, and then grab a meal late in the day for about £10 per person. Then we may have a light supper at another pub or have takeaway. Sometimes, if we are out hiking or exploring, we just grab snack foods at the local grocery store to bring with us instead of stopping for lunch. Bread, cheese and smoked salmon are delicious local options and are great in sandwiches made on the go. Often, we have gotten hungry mid-afternoon, only to find that many full-service restaurants are closed at that time. They typically close after 2 p.m. and don't reopen until 4 or 5 p.m. for dinner, so plan accordingly. Some pubs will still serve food during that time and takeaways are often open as well. Late-night dining, after 8 p.m., has a similar problem, with the same solutions. I remember one night, having driven all day from near Inverness, we took the ferry across to the Orkney Islands, arriving around 8 p.m. We took a bit of time finding our B&B, and by the time we were settled in, we were starved. We asked the hostess if there were any food options, and she sent us to the one large town, Kirkwall, and recommended either the Chinese or Indian restaurant as the only ones open. We did get there around 10 p.m., and it was delicious. The place seemed a bit like a ghost town, though, and it was even during a music festival. If you are staying at a self-catering house, you will have a kitchen where you can prepare meals at home rather than paying for expensive meals at restaurants. Granted, you are then not offered your full Scottish breakfast from the B&B, but sometimes all you want is a bowl of cereal or some toast when you wake up. Some privately owned self-catering house owners will supply, at no extra cost, fresh eggs for your fridge, especially if they have their own chickens, or even the makings for a full Scottish breakfast for the length of your stay. Drink. Pints are larger in Scotland than in the U.S., so drink carefully. And a half pint of beer or cider is about the same price as the same amount of soda, so enjoy your drink. Don't dare drink and drive, though. The penalties for such are high, and those roads are scary enough while you are sober. While you won't get points on your home driver's license, you may get arrested and the car impounded, which results in many costs. If you don't wish to pay the pub price, you can always go to the off-license, purchase some pints, and take them to the B&B to enjoy. Of course, then you miss out on the pub culture. Things to do In addition to the many places already discussed above, numerous galleries and museums in Scotland are free of charge, a great way to spend a day, especially if the weather isn't great. On finer days, many parks and gardens are free as well. You often can find local festivals and fairs to shop in, listen to music, sample food, and have a grand time with little to no cost. Of course, the landscapes are free to view, as are many historical landmarks. Children Sometimes it is very difficult to plan trips when you have children. Whether your kids are young children or rebellious teenagers, finding places which have enough to keep them interested and engaged can be quite a challenge. There is an excellent resource I discovered called Travel for Kids, which has sections for many places, including Scotland. There are lots of museums and exhibits that include interactive stuff for kids to enjoy, so keep an eye out for those. A day full of seeing ruined abbey after ruined castle after ruined abbey is enough to bore even many adults, much less children. 
and having cranky children does not help anyone enjoy their vacation. Wi-Fi Most hotels and many BNBs have now started offering free Wi-Fi, though it is not always good Wi-Fi, and some turn it off during the night hours. Many cafes have it, though, as will any McDonald's, not that I recommend going to McDonald's when in Scotland, despite it sounding like a local place, when you have so many other great options. Libraries will also have access. Some entire cities now offer free Wi-Fi, so do some research ahead of time to plan. Summary Remember earlier when I said a trip to Scotland was less expensive than a trip to Disney? Our last trip to Scotland, which was 23 days in June, was about $4,000 for airfare, rental car, trip insurance, BNBs, and food. You can spend more than this on two weeks in New York City or at Disney. And there are all sorts of ways you can trim your budget even more on your trip. Hidden Gems I cannot list all the castles, abbeys, churches, and other major attractions. There are many other places to find the popular spots. What I've tried to do is find the unusual, unique, mystical, hidden places that are a little more off the beaten path. If I have included a major site, it is because there is a compelling reason that it is popular, such as a mythical connection. I've not been to all these places myself, of course, but I have gotten lots of help from friends and other resources. A huge help was the website Undiscovered Scotland, which has interactive maps to help you find places. It is well worth some time if you are planning your own trip. Please enjoy! Aberdeenshire Aberdeenshire is chock full of castles, Pictish stones, and whiskey distilleries. What more could you need? Aberdeen City itself is known as the Granite City, for all the granite buildings that sparkle in the sun after a good rain. Achy Brace Stone Circle Though you must walk through a dense wood to reach it, this stone circle sits atop an open hill, and you might see some roe deer as you search for it. It is between the towns of Maud and Old Deer, on the summit of Parkhouse Hill. There is a bit of a climb, and parking is a bit tight, so be prepared. It is a complete circle of ten stones, with a larger recumbent, lying down, stone. This site dated back about 4,000 years when it was built by the local farming community that inhabited the hills. Do your best not to sing Achy Breaky Heart when visiting. Base of Inverary this small cemetery near Inverary hosts a medieval motte and bailey dating from 1100 CE, which appears to be guarding the small cemetery. This site was occupied by Robert the Bruce up to 1308 when he defeated the Earl of Buchan at the Hill of Barra nearby, known as the Battle of Inverary 1308, which is distinguished from the Battle of Inverary 1745 which was the result of a Jacobite uprising. There is also a line of Pictish symbol stones, the ruined walls left over from a church, and a cairn marking the Jacobite Battle of Inverary 1745. If you venture north of Inverary, you can find another Pictish stone, called the Brandisbutt Stone, with detailed carvings and Ogham writing. Braemar Castle this restored keep is one of two very rare Scottish castles which are protected by star-shaped walls, the other is Corgarth Castle, see below, both of which happen to be in the Grampian Mountains, on opposite ranges. Braemar Castle was built by John Erskine in 1628, 18th Earl of Mar, mainly as a hunting lodge, but also to counter the rising power of the Farquharson clan. The keep was sacked and burned by John Farquharson, known as the Black Colonel of Inverary, in 1689 during the first Jacobite uprising. By 1716, the castle was forfeited to the crown but eventually passed on to John Farquharson who purchased the site in 1748 who then leased it to the government as a garrison for Hanoverian troops. It served as a garrison until 1831 when the site was returned to the Farquharson clan. The property was fully restored by the 12th Laird of Invercald who entertained Queen Victoria when she was visiting Braemar for a local event called The Gathering. Documents from 1800 also note the castle had a fully intact moat. And the walls are dated to the 18th century, a time when star-shaped fortresses were popular forms of defense across the British Isles. 
The keep is reportedly inhabited by several ghosts, including a young woman who, believing herself abandoned by her newlywed husband, committed suicide. Other ghosts include a piper and a young baby. The most infamous inhabitant is the Black Colonel of Inveri himself, John Farquharson, who has reportedly been seen in certain rooms, and his tobacco is often smelled in the rooms. The castle itself has a curtain wall, turrets, a round stair tower, and stone vaulted rooms to explore. It includes a dungeon called the Laird's Pit. Brandis Butt Stone this is an unusual example of Pictish stone art in that it contains Ogham writing, which is usually found in Ireland. The Ogham spells out Irritado Erins, perhaps referencing Edernon, an original spelling of the name of a local saint, Saint Etherninus. This is a large stone that was once broken and used as a field boundary, but the pieces were found and reassembled. Nearby are the scant remains of a stone circle, the stones of which also turned up as part of the old boundary. Cairn O Mount Legend has it that in the 11th century, Macbeth had, commonly called Macbeth, survived the original English invasion but was wounded as he retreated with his men over the Cairn Mount Pass to take his last stand at the Battle at Lumfannon in 1057 by mail column Macdon Cotta. He eventually died from those wounds at nearby Scone, when his stepson, Lulok Makchio Koem Gain, became king. This route over this pass was used many times through history as a passage back to England. This cairn has been dated back to circa 2000 BCE. Corgarf Castle Nestled in the Grampian Mountains, the 16th-century fortress is set inside a very rare 18th-century star-shaped wall, the second of only two in Scotland, see Braemar above. In 1571, the place was burned which resulted in the deaths of Lady Forbes and her children, and many others in the keep. This incident resulted in the ballad, Eda Mogarden. It's no doubt the castle must be haunted by all those ghosts. It was then used as a farmhouse from 1802 to 1827 as barracks from the time of the Jacobite Uprising to 1831. The most famous and last residents of Corgarf were the Ross sisters, known as the Castle Ladies. They occupied the keep until the First World War. After that time, the property went into the hands of Sir Edmund and Lady Stockdale who used the height of the walls as a shooting perch when out hunting. The Stockdale family eventually gave the castle to the Lonnock Highland Friendly Society in 1979, and they fully restored it. Today, this castle has been restored and painted in traditional Harl plaster, a type of lime rendering which has colored stones added which removes the need to paint, to give the appearance from afar of a rather squat, square castle that looked like one white box set on a larger white box. It looks very lonely and rather sinister in its isolation. Craigievar Castle. A few miles south of Alford, this castle was built in the 1580s in an L plan and has a traditional harled surface that looks like pink colored plaster. This keep was the seat of Clan Sempil and the Forbes family for 350 years until it was given to the National Trust of Scotland in 1963, when restoration began. Today, the site is open to the public and especially noted for its plasterwork ceilings, including recreated images of the Nine Worthies asterisk and of Forbes family members. It has many turrets, gargoyles, and corbels to create a classic fairy tale castle look, and is now open to the public. There is a massive iron portcullis, hearkening back to a more defensive age. There is a secret staircase, and the interior has been restored with furnishings dating to the 17th and 18th centuries. Asterisk the note about worthies, these figures are most often seen in churches and cathedrals and hold a sacred spot in the main nave. The worthies are nine historical, scriptural, and legendary people who personified the ideals of chivalry as established in the Middle Ages, three Christians, Charlemagne, King Arthur, and Godfrey of Bouillon, followed by three pagans, Julius Caesar, Hector, and Alexander the Great, and lastly the three Jews, David, Joshua, and Judas Maccabeus. By the late 14th century, Lady Worthies began appearing to accompany the Nine Worthies, though were not standardized, and varied by region. Crath's Castle If you have many castles in your plans, and fear burning out, this may be one you still want to see. 
built first as a timber structure by the Bennets of Ley on lands given to them by Robert the Bruce in 1323, this keep stayed in the same family for nearly 400 years. The stone keep began construction in 1553 but was delayed several times due to issues with Mary, Queen of the Scots, though finally completed in 1596. A manor house extension to the keep was added in the 18th century. Crafts is very well preserved, especially the interior, which boasts original Scottish Renaissance painted ceilings which survive in several Jacobean rooms, to include the Chamber of the Muses, the Chamber of Nine Worthies, and the Green Lady's Room. It's the latter room where a green mist has been seen, which gives rise to the legend of the Green Lady. Crafts is the only castle run by the National Trust to remain open all year. The estate has 600 acres along the River Dee, including woodland and ponds, and some adventure sports such as a climbing wall. The walled gardens are especially lovely, covering nearly four acres. In 2004, excavations revealed a series of pits which were later analyzed to date back to 4000 to 8000 BCE, and possibly the oldest known lunar calendar. Colorly Stone Circle Most stone circles are similar, colorly is not. Most circles were built about 4,000 years ago, and were believed to be astronomical in nature, and only much later cairns for the dead. Colorly, however, was built over 3,500 years ago, and it has eight burial cairns inside the circle of eight standing stones, built concurrently. Seven of the eight cairns are surrounded by curb stones. The avenue leading to the circle is lined by trees in a dramatic approach, despite the power pylon right next to the circle. Dice Symbol Stones Located in the ruined Kirk of St. Fergus, these two Pictish stones are carved with different symbols. The older of the two, carved in pink-red granite, has a swimming beast, a double disc, and a zerod. The later stone is a relief sculpture, entirely filled with interlacing carvings. There are four symbols around the cross, and some rare untranslated Ogham writing, the inscription on one stone reads. Dad. There has been no translation available but, typical of Ogham writing used mainly for memorials, it's thought this stone may have a personal name inscribed on it, M-A-Q-Q possibly meaning Mac or son of, and Ragadad as the person's name. Perhaps Eatasser had a dead its Mac Ragadad, or Eatasser had a dead its son of Ragadad. We may never know. Easter Aquarthy's Circle This recumbent stone circle is one of the best in existence. There are eleven upright stones with a low bank to form a circle twenty-one yards in diameter. The stones may have been purposely chosen for their colors. The stones within the circle are pinkish in color, except the one next to the east flanker of red jasper. Both flankers are gray, while the recumbent is red granite. Fivey Castle Some castles are impressive because of where they are built, like the cliffy heights at Stirling or Edinburgh. Others are impressive because of how they are built. Fivey is one of the latter. Fivey Castle dates from the 13th century, some sources claim William the Lion, a.k.a. William I, built it in 1211. Robert the Bruce held Fivey as an open-air court, and Charles I lived there as a child. In 1390, following the Battle of Audeburn, the castle ceased being a royal stronghold and subsequently saw the possession of five successive families, each of whom added a new tower to the castle, Preston, the oldest tower, circa 1390-1433, Meldrum and Seton, Twin Tower Entrance, circa 1599, and also years later, the great processional staircase commissioned by Seton, Gordon, circa 1178, and Leith, circa 1890. Every castle seems to have a ghost legend, and Fivey is no different. One story tells that during renovation work in 1920, the skeletal remains of a woman were discovered within a bedroom wall. The remains were laid to rest in Fivey Cemetery that day, but almost immediately, castle residents started complaining about strange noises and unexplained happenings. Fearing they had offended the dead woman, the remains were exhumed and replaced behind the bedroom wall. The haunting ceased as quickly as it had begun. 
Another fivey mystery lies within a secret room in the southwest corner of the castle. Legend says it must remain sealed, lest anyone entering befall some disaster. There is also an indelible bloodstain on a wall, and two ghosts and two curses are associated with Fivey. One of the curses has been attributed to 13th century nobleman, Thomas Learmont, aka Learmount, Learmont, or Learmount. He was not normally known by his birth name, however, but often called True Thomas, so named because he could not tell a lie. He was also known as Thomas the Rhymer, possibly for his gift of rhyming poetry. Thomas was also a famous prophet who predicted the death of Alexander III in 1286 and predicted that a Scot would rule all of Britain, James I. Upon visiting Fivey a freak gust of wind is said to have shut the gates in his face, and he put the curse of the weeping stones on the place. Until three original boundary stones are removed from the area, there will always be succession problems. The first two were found, but the third is lost in the River Ithin. Grampian Mountains This isn't precisely a hidden spot, as it takes up a great swath of the countryside, but often people miss the stunning area, as they concentrate on Edinburgh and the Isle of Skye. The last time we traveled through, the browns, golds, purples and greys jumped out at every sunspot and whispered back into the earth when the clouds came. It was like the subconscious mind of an oil painter covering the landscape. Sheep jumped over streams and black lambs cavorted around, yes, really, cavorting. Shaggy highland cows looked at us as we drove by. We stopped a couple times and just stood, stunned, looking at the landscape that surrounded us. Of course, we didn't stand long. The wind threatened to blow us away, in our hastily donned shawls and sweaters. Lone Head of Daviot Stone Circle While a belt of trees shelters most of the wind, nevertheless the circle, on the top of a hill, offers lovely views to the north and east. There are ten stones as well as a recumbent stone and flankers. As with most of these circles, the original purpose seemed to be astronomical, with a later purpose of a cremation cemetery, c. 1500 BCE. The recumbent stone is actually two stones divided by a vertical cleft running their full length, which could have been some sort of fertility symbol, but was more likely to be the result of frost. Maiden Stone a Pictish stone with a distinctive notch near the top, the legend of this stone says that the daughter of the Laird of Balcane made a bet with a stranger that she could make a good supply of bannock bread faster than he could build a road to the top of Benaki. Her hand in marriage would be the prize, but the stranger was the devil, and he won. She ran and prayed, so God turned her to stone. The notch is where the devil grabbed her shoulder. The stone dates from c. 700 CE and is carved from a single slab of red granite which stands about three feet high that includes carvings of Celtic knotwork, motifs, and figures of people and animals. Midmar Kirk Stone Circle Unusual in its proximity to the church, the 17-meter stone circle has a recumbent stone with two flankers, which are eight feet long and sharp, looking a bit like demonic fangs. While some of the stones may have been moved when the church was built in 1787, and it's very likely a cairn was removed and destroyed in the process, the original stones appear to have been replaced in other areas of the churchyard. Museum of Scottish Lighthouses Many people love and revere lighthouses, and this museum is a must-see for anyone with a tender heart for them. There are a huge number of lighthouses in Scotland, as the coast is treacherous and rocky. The museum itself showcases the variety of lighthouses, including models of all sorts, the collection of real lenses and lights, keys, semaphore flags, and keepers' uniforms. Scotland's first official lighthouse was built in 1787 here at Kinnaird Head, Fraserburgh. Picardy Stone One of the oldest and simplest of the Pictish carved stones, Picardy Stone dates to around the 6th or 7th century. It has three common Pictish symbols carved into the south face, a double disc and zirod, a serpent and zirod, and what looks like a polished bronze hand mirror which were common at the time. Nearby, at Dunadir, there is a nearby that may have been linked to Picardy. Rhiney Symbol Stones 
Of the eight Pictish symbol stones found at Rhiney, the three most impressive are on display under a shelter near the parking lot at the Old Kirkyard. The largest depicts the head of an animal, possibly an otter or a seal, as well as traditional Pictish symbols of discs and zerods, which also adorn the other smaller stones. Some items found at the site also include Roman amphora from the 5th or 6th century, a Roman-style jar with two handles and a narrow neck. Another can be found in a nearby field, uphill from the Kirkyard. This may have been a settlement site for Pictish kings and can be visited by accessing a narrow single track into the valley of the water of the Bogey, just outside Rhiney village. Rhiney Man is a carving of a bearded man carrying an axe, on a six-foot-tall gabbro slab, a dark, coarse-grained plutonic rock of crystalline texture, consisting mainly of pyroxene, plagioclase feldspar, and often olivine. This stone was removed from its original location in Rhiney and now housed in Woodhill House, the headquarters of the Aberdeenshire Council. Sun Honey Stone Circle About a mile west of Act is this recumbent stone circle. It is about 27 yards in diameter, has nine stones plus a recumbent stone, with two flankers. This circle is aligned to the moon rise on the distant hillside. While it appears the original use of the stone circle stopped being used around 2000 BCE, excavations in 1865 suggest that the circle was repurposed to include cremation burials, and some small cairns were built inside the circle. Access is through a fenced field path and gate, and surrounded by a copse of trees, and is not signposted from the main road, making it a bit difficult to find. And it suggests the site has not been disturbed by agriculture or construction, so visitors would find the site in much a similar condition as when it was erected. Angus Aberlemno Stones This is a series of five spectacularly carved standing stones in the village of Aberlemno. Three are on the side of the road in town, one in the kirkyard, and one thirty yards from the church. These stones have detailed carvings of Pictish origin, showing battles, beasts, serpents, discs, mirrors, and other symbols. Most of these symbols are of unknown meaning, though there are countless theories. One cross slab shows a battle won by the Picts, with the defeated Anglian army running away in defeat. This may represent the Battle of Nectansmere from 685 CE. One is a Celtic cross slab with both Pictish and Christian carvings on it. Before Celtic crosses were carved out, with holes between the arms and circle, they were carved on slabs like this. Angus Folk Museum This is a center for rural life and history near the village of Glamis. It was begun in the 1950s and shows several terraced cottages, portraying life over the last 200 years, as well as a Victorian schoolroom and authentic farm. You can experience life in a 19th century farm, witness the spinning and weaving, the agricultural wonders of a bygone age. All sorts of implements, furniture, and artifacts are contained in the homes. There is a bothy, small village, for the farm laborers, horses in the stables, and a working blacksmithy. There are various events held during the year, as well as a gift shop. Our Broth Abbey Founded in the 12th century for Tyrannentian monks, this abbey features distinctive red sandstone construction, making it glow in the afternoon sun. It was founded by King William I the Lion, as a memorial to the Archbishop of Canterbury Thomas Becket, his childhood friend. It has a unique triforium, open arcade, above the door. The abbey is famous mostly due to its association with the 1320 Declaration of Arbroath, wherein Scotsmen declared that they will always fight for freedom, even if only 100 of them still live. Sir Walter Scott used the abbey as a basis for his description of the ruined monastery of St. Ruth in the Antiquary. The abbot's house is well worth a visit, as it's the most complete abbot's residence still remaining in Britain. A recently added display on the Stone of Destiny explores the history of the stone and its journey to the abbey in 1951. It had been removed from Westminster Abbey in an infamous heist. Edsel Castle more of a country house than a fortified structure, this castle was built in the 16th century on top of a much earlier Mott and Bailey timber fortification. Overlooking the Glenisk River, and founded by the Lindsay family, it stands now as a ruin. 
The castle has stunning red sandstone walls and a lovely parkland for exploring. The walled gardens were added in the early 17th century, though its current conformation was set in the 1930s. The nearby town, now extinct, of Edsel lives on in the name of the castle. It is open all year, and the garden has intricate relief carvings. It is thought to have links to esoteric traditions, including Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry. Each of the carved panels, three sets of seven, represent the cardinal virtues, West Wall, the liberal arts, South Wall, and the planetary deities, East Wall. There is also a bathhouse and summer house around the garden, and decorative topiary. Glamis Castle slash Garden slash E.C. Stone, no account of mystical places in Scotland would be complete without a mention of Glamis Castle, counted as the most beautiful and most haunted of Scotland's castles. While Shakespeare places Macbeth here in his Scottish play, the historical king had no connection to Glamis. Crenellations and turrets abound, giving it the look of a French chateau, and the lovely red color of the stone make it stand out in the countryside. It is surrounded by formal and informal gardens and was once a religious center. The present structure was built in the 17th century, but the Lyon family has been there since the 14th century. Before that, it had an ancient royal seat of Scottish kings. In 1034 CE, King Malcolm II was murdered at Glamis. It has since been in the hands of the Bowes Lyons family, the Queen Mother grew up at Glamis, and Princess Margaret was born there. Don't miss the crypt and the more medieval parts of the castle. There are many reported ghosts, including the woman without a tongue, the Grey Lady, Janet Douglas, Lady Glamis, burned as a witch in 1537, a young servant boy, Earl Bairdai, the fourth Earl of Crawford. There is even a legend of the monster of Glamis, a deformed child born into the family, kept locked up in the tower, and bricked up after his death. Creamier, J. M., Barry's birthplace. Who doesn't know about Peter Pan? Explore the birthplace of the author, J. M. Barry. The upper floors of the house are preserved to look like they would have when he was born, and next door is an exhibition of his literature and theater works. Children can dress up as some of his characters, and there is a garden with a Peter Pan statue, as well as a gift shop. The town itself has many buildings with a witch's stain, a Scots word for stone, built into the front, in order to ward off evil. This is a hard gray stone set into the red sandstone of the region. There is a witch pool, a small pond outside of town, where witches were supposedly drowned. There is also a Pictish stone called the Easy Stone, in nearby Easy. This town was thought to be a place of monastic importance at one time, as well. Meagle Pictish Stone Museum one of the largest collections of Pictish carved stones in Scotland is here in this old schoolhouse in the village of Meagle. This was possibly the home of King Ferrith, who ruled Pictland from 839 to 842 CE. There are many magnificent stones to see here, and three large cross slabs dominate the display. The largest, Meagle II, is eight feet tall. The earliest is Meagle I and may have originally been an ancient standing stone, as there are still prehistoric cup and ring marks near the base. There is now an ornate cross on the front, and a collection of Pictish symbols on the back. The stones are well preserved and offer incredible detail and precision. It is well worth a visit to anyone interested in the ancient carvings of the Picts. The museum is only open from April to September, so plan accordingly. Sueno's Stone This huge stone stands at about 21 feet tall. This Pictish carved stone is the largest surviving stone of its type in Scotland and is covered with spectacular details. It is now covered with a protective armored glass structure but can be seen clearly. It may have been moved at one point, as descriptions in the 18th century have it elsewhere. There are interwoven vine symbols along the edges, with a Celtic cross on the western face. Acting as a sort of stone version of the Bayou Tapestry, there is a large battle scene on the eastern face, a story told in several horizontal strips set in panels. It is dated to between C. 600-1000 CE, and there is much debate as to what the battle scene is supposed to be describing. 
Many guess that it is the defeat of the Picts by the Scots of Dalriada, under King Kenneth MacAlpin, c. 841. Other theories name Norse battles, such as against the Norse king Swain Forkbeard, Swaino. Legend says that Macbeth met his three witches at the stone. Teeling Suterain and Ducoat. This curved, stone-lined passage was once likely used for food storage in Neolithic and Iron Age times. It would have been covered by roof slabs and turf, so would have been invisible except for the small entrance. This one measures 27 yards in length and over 6 feet tall, and has interesting triangular stones set along the bottom of the wall for support. It would have been cool and dry inside, great for storing food and keeping it fresh. It was probably built some time 100 CE. It gives interesting insight into the lifestyle and needs of people during that time. The ducot or dovecot, a structure built to house pigeons or doves for food, was built in 1595 by Sir David Maxwell and is an unusual lectern shape. Argyle and Butte Arduane Garden 20 miles south of Oban, situated on the coast, this lush and mossy garden is a delightful place. It benefits from the warm winds of the Gulf Stream and is colorful in all seasons. It has 20 acres of woodland plants, including rhododendrons, camellias, azaleas, and magnolias. For those with a taste for the exotic, you can find blue Tibetan poppies, Chatham Island forget-me-nots and giant Himalayan lilies. There is a cliff-top panoramic view that is easily accessible, but the gardens themselves are private and give a feeling of intimacy. A large part of the park is handicapped accessible. Akagallan Stone Circle Located on the coast of the Isle of Arran, this circle commands a fantastic view across Macri Moor and the coast of the island. It does require a short climb up from the farm track. It has not been excavated, so there is still a great deal of mystery about its purpose and extent. It was built c. 2000 BCE and has 15 upright slab stones around a large cairn. It is built on a sloping hill, and the downhill stones are slightly taller, so the tops are roughly even. Bonaw Iron Furnace If you have any interest in the industrial age, this is a great place to indulge your curiosity. The furnace, located in a beautiful setting at the head of Loch Etive and nearby the Glen Nant National Nature Reserve, is the most complete charcoal-fueled ironworks in Britain. It was founded in 1853, and the displays explain the industrial heritage and how pig iron was made. It produced up to 700 tons of iron per year for over 100 years and shows a map of where the ore was extracted from in the hills surrounding the site. It was located in this place to bring the iron ore to where charcoal for smelting it was readily available, thus nearby woodlands were needed. Up to 600 tree cutters and charcoal burners were employed across a huge area. Castle Stalker If you've ever watched Monty Python and the Holy Grail, you will have seen Castle Stalker, known in the movie as Castle of Arg, near the end of the movie. While it is easy enough to see from the road, it is built on a tidal islet in Loch Lake, and therefore a bit more difficult to get to, especially at high tide. It was originally a small fort built in 1320 by Clan MacDougall, and then owned by the Stuarts and Clan Campbell. It has since been taken back by the Stuarts, who spent ten years rebuilding and restoring it to habitability. It remains a private home, but is open to the public at selected times during the summer. Glenbar Abbey Home of the Clan McAllister, about 20 miles north of the Mole of Kintyre, you can explore the heritage and home of the Clan McAllister. They have historical records to conduct your own research, guided tours, and a chance to visit with the head of the clan. In the winter, there is a midwinter Cayley, a party held by the laird for his servants and neighbors. The original house was built circa 1700 and may have originally been a tavern or horse-changing station for travelers. It was called Bar House at first, and then the village of Glenbar grew around it. The current house was designed by James Gillespie Graham and completed in 1815. It was newly named Glenbar Abbey, though it was never used as a religious house. Glen Co. 
Glencoe itself is beautiful, soaring mountains and serene glens, as well as the lovely desolation of the nearby Rannoch Moor. But the history leaves a haunted feeling to any visit. It is also a mystical spot, the birthplace of Oisin, according to a local bard, John Cameron. Glencoe is said to mean the Glen of Weeping and reflects the horrible events surrounding the Glencoe Massacre in 1692. There is an historical fiction book that recounts this horrible time, Lady of the Glen, by Jennifer Robeson. George R. R. Martin also used this event as an inspiration for his story of the Red Wedding in his Game of Thrones series. Holy Island just next to the Isle of Arran, this two-thirds mile by two-mile island has a long history as a sacred site. There is a holy well with healing properties, a hermit cave from St. Molay's, a 6th-century monk, and evidence of a 13th-century monastery. Runic writing can be found in the cave. Several areas of the island are dedicated to religion and nature. Currently, a Buddhist community is living on the island, practicing Tibetan Buddhism. A community of nuns is on the southern end of the island. There is a wildlife preserve with Ariske ponies, Sonnen goats, and Soe sheep. Iona Abbey Whether you are here for religious reasons or not, there is no denying the rich ecclesiastic history on this island. This small island off the southwest end of the Isle of Mull was host to the first established monastery in Scotland by St. Columba of Ireland in 563 CE, which began the conversion of Picts to Christianity and was a leading force in Celtic Christianity. This may also have been the origin of Ireland's Book of Kells as well as the Celtic Cross as we know it today. The writer Samuel Johnson visited in 1773 and wrote that man is little to be envied whose patriotism would not gain force upon the plain of Marathon or whose piety would not grow warmer among the ruins of Iona. The present abbey was built circa 1203 and a convent was established in 1208. There is an Iron Age hill fort dating from c. 100 BCE, several gift shops of local craftsmen, and the infirmary museum to explore. The island is truly steeped with peace and tranquility. My short visit was truly memorable, despite being a rainy, overcast day, and I highly recommend it. The island can be reached via a short ferry ride from Fyanford on Mole. Isle Pronounced Iwaila, known as the Queen of the Hebrides, this small island is Scotland's fifth largest island. There is much evidence of prehistoric settlement, with an arrowhead from 10,800 BC discovered, and today has over 3,000 inhabitants. Dunnose Bridge is an Iron Age fort on a prominent crag with great views of the landscape. The odd name could come from several different mixed Scottish Gaelic and Old Norse sources, such as Noseborg, Fort on the Crag, or Nausbog, Turf Fort. There is also a ruined brock at Dunboraraic and the remains of several roundhouses. The Kildalton High Cross dates to around 800 CE and is the last unbroken ringed Celtic cross in Scotland. The picturesque ruins of Dunvaig Castle, a Macdonald stronghold, sit on one coast. It has a total of eight whiskey distilleries, more than enough to keep even the keenest enthusiast happy, including Lafroig, Ardbeg, and Bolmore. Birdwatching, hillwalking, horseback riding, and fishing are popular activities, especially during the winter, when large flocks of wild geese visit. About a quarter of the population speaks Gaelic. Isle of Arran Described as Scotland in miniature, this island has a bit of everything. It has been continuously inhabited since Neolithic times and was colonized from Ireland in the 6th century. St. Brendan may have founded the Monastery of Aileach on the island, and St. Molay's is said to have been active there. It is divided into highland and lowland areas by the Highland Boundary Fault and is a popular destination for geologists. Beautiful beaches, mountains, rolling hills and spectacular sea views, combined with a wealth of flora and fauna, make this a great, compact vacation spot. There are odd sandstone structures that look like sand dunes, chalk deposits, and volcanic formations. It is ringed by post-glacial raised beaches, such as King's Cave. 
several standing stone groups, such as the Six Circles on Macri Moor, as well as several Neolithic cairns, have been excavated, and there is evidence of humans dating back as far as 8,000 years. There are a couple of castles, such as Brodick and Locranza, and the Monastery of Aliac. Isle of Staffa If the weather is good, you could catch a ferry from Mole to this lonely island, covered in puffins, kittiwakes, and other seabirds. Be prepared, though, we had to wait three days until the weather had cleared enough for us to go. The odd hexagon stone structures are something out of true legend, the same legend as the Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland comes from. This is the other end of the causeway, where Fingal, Finn Mac Hill, the Giant had his cave. Mendelssohn wrote music about the place in his Hebrides Overture. The stone structure is volcanic basalt, resulting in the extraordinary pattern of columns that makes this place unique. Inverary Castle Who doesn't want to see a fairy tale castle? Situated on the shores of Loch Fyne, this castle dates from the 1400s, but the present form was built in the 1700s and then renovated after a fire in 1877. It is fully restored and decorated, and open for tours. Get there early, before the tour buses arrive. The sixteen acres of gardens are well set for the different seasons, with daffodils around Easter and rhododendrons and azaleas during the summer. Heathers, roses, and other trees fill out the rest of the year. Kilmartin Glen this area has a high concentration of Neolithic and Bronze Age sites, more than 350 ancient sites in a six-mile radius. This must have been an integral part to the ancients' life to have spent so much time creating these megalithic sites. There are standing stones, a henge, a linear cemetery with five burial cairns, and many cup and ring decorated stones. The royal center of the Dal Riata at Dunad is in the north of the glen, and there is a museum of ancient culture in the village of Kilmartin. The site includes Glebe Cairn, the Nether Largy Cairns and Standing Stones, and the Recruin Cairn. The churchyard in Kilmartin has three stone crosses, the seven Paltalock stones, and twenty-three stones in the Lapidarum. Many of the carvings have predominant decorative themes such as knights and swords. Kilmartin House Museum does a fantastic job of tying in the disparate bits and presenting them in a comprehensive way. Loch Ediv Everyone knows about Loch Ness and Loch Lomond, but these are not, by far, the only lovely lochs in Scotland. Loch Ediv, long and thin on the west coast, is more like a Norwegian fjord than a loch. It is often overlooked as the modern road doesn't pass along most of its length. Surrounded by distinctive mountains, there are good tracks on both sides for hikers. There are also cruises out of Kelly's Pier at the Bonna Iron Furnace. It is often possible to see deer, seals, and golden eagles, or perhaps see eagles on a trip on the loch. Be sure to bring your binoculars for the trip. McCaig's Tower Often called McCaig's Folly, this structure on Battery Hill dominates the Oban skyline. John Stuart McCaig commissioned this structure as a monument to his family, as well as providing winter work for local unemployed stonemasons. He loved Roman and Greek architecture and had planned for a colosseum like the one in Rome. His death, however, brought an end to construction after only the outer walls were built. It now sits as a prominent tower overlooking Oban, with a circumference of over 200 yards and two tiers of arches. It is now used as a public garden and has magnificent views of the surrounding islands. Rothsey Castle Located on the Isle of Butte in the best natural harbor on the island, this ruined castle, built in the 13th century, has been described as one of the most remarkable in Scotland for its long history and circular plan. Built by the Stuart family, it became a royal residence after surviving several Norse attacks, thanks partly to the huge curtain wall, surrounded by a wide moat. The siege from King Hakon IV lasted three days, while the attackers tried to hack their way through the stone wall with axes. This was discouraged by the pouring of boiling pitch from above. Eventually, the Norse took the castle, but they had to withdraw immediately, due to a large Scottish fleet arriving shortly thereafter. 
It was excavated in the early 19th century, and some restoration was made circa 1900, but much of what you see today dated back to its original 13th century construction. There are fine views from the top of the wall back towards the mainland. Scottish Sea Life Sanctuary Next to Loch Cririn, this sanctuary plays host to many marine animals, from octopus to sharks. You can see rays as they swim to the surface to meet you, stand in a shoal of salmon, or attend talks and demonstrations about starfish and crabs. Children can be entertained with feeding demonstrations, interactive talks, and the seal rescue facility with a pup nursery. St. Columba's Cave For those interested in tracing this iconic saint's footsteps, a trip to the cave is a must. This ancient site is located at Loch Caelisport and is very remote. Along with evidence of human habitation from 10,000 years ago, there are drawings of simple crosses that are believed to date from St. Columba's first arrival to Scotland from Ireland, while he awaited permission to start a monastery on Iona. You can see an outcropping that shows two footprints, said to be those of St. Columba himself. There are footprints carved into stone in a number of places throughout Scotland and Ireland and are usually part of ancient king-making ceremonies. There is a 13th-century chapel nearby, in ruins, and a holy spring. Ayrshire Ardrossan Castle What is more picturesque than a ruined castle on a ridge? This moated ruin stands above the town of Ardrossan. The site dates from the 12th century, the keep from the 15th, and has a kitchen, cellars, and a well. It was used by William Wallace, where he slaughtered an English garrison, earning it the name Wallace's Larder. This was Clan Barclay's keep, partially destroyed during the Wars of Scottish Independence. It was later rebuilt by Sir John Montgomery, the seventh Baron of Eaglesham, but was demolished again by Cromwell's forces. If you explore, do so with caution, as the ruins are condemned. Colzeen Castle slash Suter Johnny's Cottage a clifftop castle on the Ayrshire coast, this is an impressive 18th-century construction with a circular saloon overlooking the sea and a grand oval staircase. Then General Eisenhower was a frequent visitor and had one apartment set aside for him. During the summer, there is access to the sea caves below the castle. It is reputed to have at least seven ghosts, including a piper and a young girl. It appeared as Lord Summerizzle's home in 1970's cult classic film, The Wicker Man. Nearby is Suter Johnny's Cottage, in the village of Kirk Oswald. Robert Burns spent a summer at school here, and featured in his poem, Tam O' Shanter. The cottage is a thatched-roofed place with a workshop, complete with all the tools needed for shoemaking. The garden behind the cottage has a restored thatched alehouse. Dean Castle also known as Kilmarnock Castle and Boyd Castle, the lands were originally gifted to Sir Robert Boyd, Earl of Kilmarnock, by King Robert I, a.k.a. Robert the Bruce, in 1315 for their support of the Bruce at the Battle of Bannockburn, circa 1314. The Boyds ruled over Kilmarnock for over 400 years, and today have strong historical ties with many people and events from Scottish history, Robert the Bruce, of course, James III of Scotland whose sister married a Boyd, the Covenanters, some of whom were imprisoned here, Bonnie Prince Charlie, whose rebellion was joined by the 4th Earl of Kilmarnock, and Robert Burns who was encouraged to publish his poetry by the Earl of Glencairn who owned the castle at that time. The tower keep was completed around 1350 to replace a timber fortress, was built mainly for defense, with few windows and the only door several yards above ground level and originally accessed by ladder. Today, the keep includes a museum of medieval armor, including equine, and a fully restored interior which is open to the top of the keep and including a minstrel's gallery, privy, and ladies' solar. In the basement, an oubliette, place of forgetting, was discovered. In the 1460s, the manor was built beside the tower and was the main residence until 1746 when a kitchen fire destroyed part of the manor. The thatch roofing on the tower was also set alight, destroying the keep. 
At the time of the disaster, the last Boyd to occupy the site, William Boyd, was in financial difficulties and was forced to sell the estate, which changed hands over the next 145 years until Thomas Evelyn Scott Ellis, 8th Lord Howard B. Walden, inherited the property. He set about to restore the keep immediately, completing it in 1906. Thomas Evelyn Scott Ellis, a note should be added about Thomas. He was eaten educated, a landowner in his own right before the Dean Inheritance, a writer of several books and plays, and patron of the arts and music. He served in the Boer War, and while rebuilding the Dean Estates, he also trained for the 1908 Olympics where he competed as a motorboat racer, and in his later years, he was president of the National Museum of Wales, and was a governor of the National Library of Wales. In 1938, he became a trustee of the Tate Gallery. He completed the Manor House restoration in 1946, just months before his untimely death. Dean Castle gets its name from the Dean, Wooded Valley, which is a commonplace name in Scotland. The estate is surrounded by natural woodland, and today, the estate is not only fully restored, but the woodland is also home to a native wildlife restoration project, but also has a rare breed park. The full site is open to the public. Electric Bray Up for a wee bit of fairy magic? This is a gravity hill in Ayrshire, where cars mysteriously appear to be rolling uphill. The effect is an illusion, as the road really does go downhill. There are several of these around the world, but this stretch of road is the most well-known in Scotland. Bray is a Scots word for hill slope or brow, and the name electric came when electricity was a strange new technology, and applied to any odd force or phenomenon. Robert Burns Birthplace Museum slash Burns Monument slash Burns Cottage the small town of Alloway was the birthplace of Robert Burns, Scotland's greatest bard, and now houses a museum dedicated to his life, the cottage he grew up in, and a monument to his honor. In case you are worried the children will be bored, there are many interactive displays and exhibits to entertain the young and the young at heart, as well as an outdoor play area and gardens. There is a Burns trail of places in the area to visit. The visitor center is large and nicely displays and explains his life works. Banffshire Belindalock Castle and Gardens The castle is known as the Pearl of the North and dates from the 17th century. It has been the home of a single family in all that time, the Macpherson Grants. There is a tale that the original site, on a nearby hill, was abandoned after its foundation stones had been laid. The laird had heard a voice tell him to build the fort in the cow meadow, and so he did. Much of the decor and furniture date from the late 18th and early 19th century and are impeccably maintained. There are several ghosts said to haunt it, including that of General James Grant and the Green Lady, said to be the current laird's guardian angel. There is a rock garden, a dovecot, and is still lived in, though open to tourists during the summer months. There are workshops on its grounds as well. Belindalock Whiskey Distillery is here on the estate, Scotland's first single estate distillery, and is well situated on the whiskey trail. Burney Kirk Just south of Elgin, this small church is one of the oldest churches in continuous use in Scotland, built circa 1140, and was once a cathedral. It lost that status when a bishop died in 1184, and the county seat was moved elsewhere. The site it was built on what was believed to be the site of an earlier Celtic church, possibly dedicated to St. Brendan the Navigator. St. Brendan was thought to have traveled west from Ireland on a voyage of discovery and possibly reached Iceland or even Newfoundland. Though small, the church is very well built with lovely stained glass art, including a window dedicated to St. Columba. The square-shaped coronic bell is over a thousand years old and is thought to have been blessed by the Pope, though no one can say precisely which Pope. There is a Pictish stone in the kirkyard with a carving of an eagle, linking this church with the first Pictish church on the site. Cairngorm Reindeer Centre Fancy playing with some reindeer? Britain's only herd is found free-ranging in the Cairngorm Mountains. The animals were reintroduced to Scotland in 1952 to a Swedish reindeer herder named Mikkel Jutzi. 
Today, there are about 150 tame reindeer, most of them on the Glenlivet estate. You can visit them daily during the summer months, though they are more difficult to find in the winter. Feeding or going on a trek to see the animals make for an unusual and interesting day out. The calves are born in May and June, and some of the reindeer are very friendly. Be careful, they might try to search your bags for treats. Inveraven Pictish Stones Located within the Inveraven Parish Church to protect them from the elements, these four carved stones date back to between 600 and 800 CE. There may have been a chapel dedicated to St. Drosten on the site from the 600s. Later, a church dedicated to St. Peter was built in 1108. Nearby is a holy well dedicated for him. The current church was entirely rebuilt in 1806, which is when the four carved Pictish stones were brought inside to protect them from the weather. The stones have carvings of an eagle, a mirror and comb, a triple disc, and other common Pictish symbols for which we have no verified interpretation. Plus Garden Abbey Plus Garden is the only medieval monastery in Britain still inhabited by monks and being used for its original purpose. It was founded in 1230 by King Alexander II of Scotland and lies in the peaceful glen of the Blackburn, about six miles from Elgin. Alexander wanted to demonstrate his authority over a disputed portion of his kingdom, so he established Plusgarden, Bowley, and Ardchatton Priories. It isn't open to the public to view, so you can only see the grounds and the main chapel. However, this does offer some lovely stained glass windows and some carved stones. The rest of the abbey is reserved for the monks' use and those guests on retreat. It's rather surreal to explore a working, living abbey after seeing so many in ruins, crumbling from the weight of the years. Speyside Cooperage Just south of Craigellachie, this fascinating place will show you the process of creating the barrels used in the famous Speyside whiskey. You can see artistic stacks of casks outside, a huge barrel bridge, cafe and shop, and exhibitions, from acorn to cask, with all sorts of informative displays. You can even make your own barrel. Berwickshire Coldingham Priory, while this church is in some ruin, it continues to be a meeting spot for the local Church of Scotland Parish for Coldingham. The grounds have a community garden with a monastic theme, growing plants with medicinal and aromatic properties. The priory is constructed of somewhat pinkish stone, which becomes especially vibrant in the rain. Two of the walls, north and east, are incredibly ornamented, while the others are strikingly plain. There is sort of a stonework graveyard, with headstones, coffin lids, and other bits of funereal sculpture, all set aside in a strange assemblage. There has been a monastery on this site since 635 CE and is associated with a Northumbrian princess who became Saint Ebb. Much of the church you see today was started in 1662, after several times of being destroyed and rebuilt. Near the priory, you can find the Idra March, originally part of a Norman church. This arch was preserved as the entrance to a mausoleum, showing off the intricate archway carvings. It was the entrance to the Church of the Virgin Mary from at least as long ago as 1130. In 1732 it was moved to the mausoleum. This site is not far from Coldingham Priory above. Mellerstain House This Georgian house north of Kelso in the borders was designed by William and Robert Adam and is the only remaining complete building of their design. It is well known for its beauty, with a highly decorated and embellished interior, period furniture and a fine art collection. Currently, it is home to the 13th Earl of Haddington. The art collection includes work by Gainsborough, Nasmith, Ramsey, and Van Dyke. There are Italianate terraced gardens, areas for picnics, a playground for children, and a lake to attract visitors. Caithness Caithness Brock Center, have you explored some of the many Brocks in Caithness, Orkney, Shetland or Lewis, only to wonder more about the people who live there? Then the Caithness Brock Center is a place to visit. There are more Brocks in Caithness per square mile than anywhere else. The center details the lifestyles and customs of the people who built and lived in the various Brocks around Scotland. 
It's built inside an old-school house on the main road from Wick to John Oak Roads. A brock is a dry stone construction tower with two circular walls. Stairways were built within the walls, and they were very popular during the last couple of centuries BC and the first centuries AD. No one is certain if they were defensive structures, living quarters, or both. Castle of May and Gardens Formerly known as Barragill Castle, this is the northernmost castle on the mainland of the UK and has lovely views of the Orkney Islands and the Old Man of Hoy on clear days. Though modest in size, it is in excellent condition and decorated in a very homey way. There are gardens and an animal center, a tea room and shop for visitors. You can even arrange to get married there. You can climb the tower within the walled garden as well. The castle was used in officers' rest home in World War II and then purchased by Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, who used it for holidays. She had seen it while mourning her husband's death and fell in love with the place. She restored it and made it a tribute to her late husband, King George VI. Since her death, it was given to a trust and opened to the public. Grey Cairns of Camster among the oldest stone monuments in Scotland, these two homes of the dead were built over 5,000 years ago. Their location, on a windswept lonely moor, probably ensured their unusual state of preservation and survival. The two cairns are quite different. One is a round structure, about 20 yards in diameter, while the other is 76 yards in diameter, strung out along a ridge line. You can stand upright even in the smaller of the two burial chambers, the round cairn. The long cairn is 66 yards long and 22 yards wide, and has two curved forecourts, one at each end. Excavations in the 1800s discovered burnt bones, pottery, tools and skeletal remains. The entrances require crawling in and are not for the claustrophobic. Hill all many stains. While physically not incredibly impressive, such as the Ring of Broger, the hill o many stains is interesting in its own right. It boasts about 200 stones arranged in a fanned-out pattern, none more than a yard high. Believed to have been created during the Bronze Age, this windswept hill on the coast could have been set to track lunar movements, but many other similar stone row arrangements can be linked to the moon. This type of stone row construction is unknown outside Caithness and Sutherland. Laid Hay Croft Museum Consisting of three main buildings, this museum of crofting life is on the A9 near Dunbath, set in a 200-year-old longhouse. The long white thatched building stands out against the landscape easily seen from the road, sparkling white when the sun shines. The site includes a barn and threshing machines to complete the picture. The crofts are similar to the black houses of the Western Isles, with a central peat hearth to provide warmth and cooking fire, and a door in the front and the back. Often there was a drainage ditch through the center of the croft to carry away animal wastes, especially during the long winter months when livestock were kept inside. Usually, the uphill side of the house would be where the humans would live. You can really get a sense of the lifestyle these folk had lived from the displays. North Coast of Scotland. So, it's not exactly hidden, but until the past few years, it's rarely mentioned. We drove all along this coast from Orkney to our turn down to Ullapool. Along the way we saw deer, sheep butts, cavorting, shaggy coos, and some of the most spectacular scenery I saw on my entire trip. There were sure cliffs, sandy beaches, blue and aquamarine bays, diving seabirds, and rolling green hills. Each time we turned another corner, came around another bend, we would scream, Oh, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And then we would turn another corner, and scream it again, and again, and again. Why had no one mentioned this delightful part of Scotland to me in my research? I never came across anything talking about the incredible beauty of this drive. I had imagined it would be a fairly boring drive across barren cliffs and dry, brown fields, but I was so very, very wrong. There were glens and valleys, mountain tarns with crystal-clear reflections of the puffy clouds above. Tantalizing glimpses of the seaside peeked through mountains to the right. 
By the time we arrived at Olapool, we were almost drained from the constant beauty and stunning landscapes we had driven through. Smoo Cave This is the largest sea cave in Scotland that was formed by both sea and river water. It is not difficult to climb down, though there are many, many steps. Some are a bit tricky, but it's in good repair. There is normally a guided tour into the cave, but they can be cancelled due to flooding, but the cave remains open. As you enter the mouth of the cave, you can see there is a cave stream coming out of the mouth of the cave, walk over the bridge, and then into the cave. Walk into the underground waterfall cavern, oh, so powerful, so incredible. There is a hole in the cave itself that lets in some sunlight, so you can see this strong, massive waterfall pushing the water out. It's not some mountain stream trickle, but a full-blown, powerful fall. I got soaked from the spray just standing and gazing at it. Waligo Steps Waligo, Whale Geo or Inlet of Wales, is a small port town near the town of Wick and primarily a harbor for fishermen. The 365 man-made steps were used by the wives to haul up the creels, baskets, of herring their husbands caught. They were gutted on the harbor and taken up the steps to be sold in Wick, eight miles away. The steps are a bit difficult to find, as they are not signposted on the main road, look for the town of Olbster off the A99. Also, take great care in climbing or descending the steps. They are well maintained, but they are natural stone, so can be slippery, especially in the fog or wet weather. There are spectacular sea cliffs and many sea birds, as well as a sea cave to explore. Clackmananshire A low tower The clan Erskine family, also known as the Earls of Mar, lived in this medieval tower dating from the 14th century. It is one of the earliest and largest of Scotland's tower houses, an impressive square keep. It had a larger classical house around it at one point, but now stands alone once again. There are four floors to explore, and even an abbot's curse. The curse was placed on John Erskine, the 17th Earl of Mar by the abbot of Cambuskeneth. The curse predicted he should rise high, but fall hard, and his work be never finished. His lands were to go to strangers, until all he held dear was in ruin. In effect, the curse was true, Mar's work, the townhouse Erskine was building, was never finished. The parts that are finished have an amazing display of mermaids, gargoyles and monsters on its crumbling walls. You can also see a dungeon, a stone well built into the tower walls, period costumes and art from the family's private collection. Clackmannan Stone This ancient stone is associated with the Celtic god of the sea, Manau or Manon. It rests on a larger stone next to the Mercat Cross and Tollbooth at the top of Main Street in the town of Clackmannan. The legend is that Robert the Bruce, while in town, lost his glove. He asked where it was, and was told to look about ye, as the county coat of arms includes a pair of gloves. Dunmore Pineapple A folly is a structure made for no purpose other than to be pretty. They were very common in the 18th and 19th centuries, and usually found at the end of estate gardens. This one looks like a giant pineapple on a hothouse, which gives it its name, and is located in Dunmore Park, just northwest of Earth. It's said to be the most bizarre building in Scotland. There are several different architectural styles in play at Dunmore, including Palladian, Ionic Columns and Tuscan Columns. The estate has a large country mansion and two large walled gardens. Walled gardens kept out the winds and allowed a sheltered environment for more delicate flowers and trees to flourish, plants that normally wouldn't survive this far north. Dumfrieshire A. E. Totem Pole This wooden carved pole, standing 16 feet high, was created as part of the A. E. Youth Eye Project in 2006 by chainsaw sculptor Peter Bosher. Its entire surface is covered in carvings, many of them elements of the natural world, such as eagles, herons, deer, foxes, and owls, but also with some modern imagery as it pertains to nature. The background pine motive separates the different images. Drumlanrig Castle and Gardens 
Nicknamed the Pink Palace for the pink sandstone construction, Drumlanrig is located on the Queensbury Estate near Dumfries. This majestic manor house was constructed in the late 17th century as a perfect example of Renaissance architecture. The house was constructed by the first Duke of Queensbury, William Douglas, and is home to the current Duke and Duchess of Buccleuch and Queensbury. You probably won't have time to explore all the 120 rooms, but you can see the 17 turrets and four towers from the outside, at least. The art collection is extensive and contains works by Rembrandt, da Vinci, and many others. The 90,000-acre estate has walks, elegant gardens, biking trails, fishing, and kids' activities. Gretna Green Many may have heard of Gretna Green, it is even featured in some traditional songs and in some movies. It has become the Scottish version of Las Vegas for quick weddings, thanks to Lord Harvick's marriage law, a strict law enacted in England in the 18th century where couples had to reach the age of 21 to marry without their parents' consent. The law didn't apply to Scotland, where couples over the age of 16 could marry with or without parental consent. This is still the case. Gretna Green is the first village over the Scottish border easily accessible to travelers from England bent on matrimony. The more unusual aspect is that the most respected tradesman, the blacksmith, often performed the ceremony, and as a result, Gretna Green has a huge collection of anvils. In ancient times, the blacksmith was often considered a sorcerer or magician for his ability to change rock into useful metal. Perhaps some of that mystical reputation is still remembered in Gretna Green. Twelve Apostles Stone Circle Located between the villages of Hollywood and Newbridge, this is the fifth largest stone circle in Britain and the largest on the mainland of Scotland. It has eleven stones, five of which are earthfast. The tallest upright stone is six feet tall. The circle is almost 100 yards in diameter, but it isn't a true circle, it's sort of flattened. Some of the stones have many cut marks on them. Most stone circles have few artifacts found inside or buried nearby. Usually some burnt bones or pottery are all that remains of our forebears. However, a four-inch bronze figure was uncovered around 1882, a statue later identified as that of St. Norbert and dated to the 12th century. Ruthwell Cross Built probably by Anglo-Saxon monks in Northumbria but was brought to Scotland. The traditional story is that it was originally sited on the Solway Firth. It is currently housed in the Ruthwell Parish Church, away from the elements. The cross stands 17 feet tall, and the carvings are well-defined. It is probably the oldest surviving text of English poetry, before any known manuscripts. There are both decorative carvings and runic and Latin inscriptions on the cross. One side has a scene of Mary Magdalene drying Christ's feet, while the other has Christ as judge, with two animals. There are many other panels, and the meanings of them all are subject to debate among scholars. While during the 16th century Reformation, the cross was left unharmed. It was eventually ordered for dismantling in 1640 by orders from the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, citing many idolatrous monuments erected and made for religious worship to be taken down, demolished, and destroyed. It wasn't until 1642 that the cross was actually destroyed and scattered around the churchyard. In 1823, Church minister, Henry Duncan, set about collecting all the pieces he could find and restored the cross. He commissioned a new crossbeam as the original was lost. He then erected it in the manse garden. The runic symbols have been translated to Christ weighs on Rodi. Where are fusi fear ran quomu il til anum? Or in modern English as Christ was on the cross. Yet the brave came there from afar to their lord. Dunbartonshire Bearsden Roman Baths Situated on a Roman road on the northwest edge of Glasgow, the remains of this bathhouse were discovered when the old Victorian houses in the area were demolished in 1973 in a plan to build apartment blocks. It is the best surviving example of a bathhouse in Scotland. 
The earliest known settlement in the area dates to 142 to 144 CE when the Romans occupied the region between the Antonine Wall and Hadrian's Wall. Little of the Roman fort built here is left, but the bathhouse is well preserved. Glasgow Necropolis A necropolis is a city of the dead, and this one, built in 1832, is next to Glasgow, St. Mungo's, Cathedral. Pressure began in Britain to create pretentious cemeteries for the wealthy following the creation of Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. One of the oldest monuments is that of an 1825 statue of John Knox, a 16th-century Scottish clergyman and leader of the Protestant Reformation, viewed as the father of the Presbyterian denomination. Other monuments include those to Scottish chemist and industrialist, Charles Tennant, who invented bleaching powder and founded an industrial dynasty, the John Henry Alexander Monument, manager of the Theatre Royal, Blackie and Sons Publishing, and others, as well as war memorials, stillborn children and others. In all, over 50,000 people are memorialized or buried here in this 37-acre garden of sculpture, and each one has a story to tell. There is no formal grid layout, and the paths meander around many of the larger monuments. Be sure to allocate plenty of time to wander the Byzantine paths and explore the fantastic funereal sculptures. People's Palace and Winter Gardens Located in Glasgow, this museum and glasshouse was opened in 1898 by the Earl of Rosebery. At a time when the city was one of the most overcrowded and unhealthy places to live, the palace and gardens provided a cultural retreat for the people, a place to enjoy nature and relax even when nature isn't behaving. If the weather is inclement during your stay, it provides an excellent haven from the elements. You can see the social history for the city of Glasgow, telling the story of the people from 1750 to today. The Winter Gardens has exotic plants and palms to enjoy year-round. There is a cafe to relax in and a recently restored Bolton fountain outside. To enjoy St. Mungo Museum of Religious Life and Art this is the only public museum dedicated only to religion and is filled with stained glass and sculptures. It is not solely concentrated on Christian faith either, as it has exhibits on Islamic calligraphy, Sikhism, Judaism, Hinduism and a Zen garden. The museum was constructed in 1993 on the site of a medieval castle complex, formerly the residence of the bishops of Glasgow. It has a sort of medieval style to blend into the architectural style of its neighbor, the province lordship, Glasgow's oldest house. It's near the necropolis, so it makes a good day trip to visit both. Willow Tea Rooms One of Glasgow's dearest darlings is artist and architect, Charles Rennie Mackintosh. If you fancy art deco, or art history, stop by for some tea at this lovely shop. Macintosh had complete control over its decor, from windows to chairs, architecture and layout, and it remains a sweet stop from the madness that is downtown Glasgow. Macintosh had met Catherine Cranston, the daughter of a tea merchant and a strong supporter in the temperance movement. In order to provide a place to drink non-alcoholic beverages, Macintosh designed this venue for people to relax and drink tea in several rooms within one building. He provided artwork and murals for several of her other tea rooms, but this one he designed completely. Different rooms have different themes. The ladies' tea room was in light colors of white, silver and rose, while the men's tea room was darker, with oak paneling and gray canvas. The willow motif is an integral part of the decoration in the interior, as well as the timberwork in the furniture and building. East Lothian Athel Stainford this town gets its name from a battle between the Saxon king Ethelstane and his rival, Pictish king Hungus, in the 9th century. The legend says the Picts won the battle after they saw a white cross of clouds in the sky. Attributing their victory to St. Andrew, they adopted his cross on the flag, which remains today, and he became their patron saint. Ethelstane was slain at the river crossing, thus the name Athelstaneford. While the historicity of the legend is debated, it has at least lent a name to the area and the ford. The village contains the National Flag Heritage Center, housed in an oddly shaped ducat, dovecot, built in 1583.
There is a Salter Trail which has various local landmarks in the area. Chester's Hill Fort This fort offers us a mystery. A series of ramparts and an Iron Age fortified village which has remained unexcavated offers some mystery. An elaborate system of ramparts and ditches were created, and no one is certain why. A better site would be the higher hill next to it, but instead, this spot was chosen. By choosing the lower site, it was vulnerable from the higher ground to projectile weapons such as arrows or slings. It was later built over by a settler for whom the ramparts were less important, it seemed. Dunbar Castle It makes me sad to see such a frail remnant of what was once a mighty fortress. The vagaries of time, destruction, and neglect rob us of so much of our history. This was once a center of power for the ancients, a spot of particular strategic importance in Scotland. The name of this castle comes from the Brythonic language, Dine Bar, Fort of the Point. It was already a defensive structure in the 7th century for the kings of Bernishnisha. It was said to have been burned down by Kenneth MacAlpin, King of the Scots. The first stone castle on the site is thought to have been built in 1070 CE by Gospatric, Earl of Northumbria. Though it was besieged many times, it had a reputation of invulnerability. It was in December of 1567 by order of the Parliament of Scotland, following the battle at Carberry Hill in June and a siege in September, that Dunbar and the fortress on Inchkeith were to be cast down utterly to the ground and destroyed in such a way that no foundation thereof be the occasion to build thereupon in time coming. The following year, some of those stones were used to construct the quayside on the shore of Leith. What remains of the once mighty fortress is a picturesque ruin overlooking the harbour. Access into the ruins is not allowed. National Museum of Flight Tired of castles and abbeys? How about some planes? Located in one of the original wartime buildings of the Royal Air Force, East Fortune Airfield, just south of the village of East Fortune, in East Lothian, this museum is a scheduled property of national importance, so no permanent structures may be added. The hangars, control tower, and stores all to remain as a testament to the history of flight in Britain. The collection began in 1909 when the Royal Scottish Museum acquired Percy Pilcher's Hawk Glider. There are many planes on exhibit today, including a 1910-33 horsepower Wright engine donated by Orville Wright. There are displays on military aviation, civil aviation, storage and restoration and the Concord experience. July usually boasts an air show, and you can take helicopter flights as well. This museum has grown to become one of the most important aviation museums in the whole of Great Britain. Preston Mill and Fantasy Ducat The mill is an architectural oddity, with a conical roof of pan tiles, S-shaped fired tiles, and is East Lothian's last working water mill. A working mill has been on the site since the 16th century and in operation until the mid-1950s, mainly producing oatmeal. The site consists of the mill, kiln, and miller's house. A short walk across the river, you will find the beehive-shaped fantasy boxes. The parapet is in the unusual shape of a horseshoe. There is a walled garden dedicated to the rearing of Gloucester and Berkshire pigs, black rock hens, and organic produce. Tantalon Castle. If you want to explore a ruin with all sorts of interesting places, curtain wall, inner and outer courtyards, corner turrets, portcullis, drawbridge, spiral stairs, gun ports, garderobes, and a pit prison, Tantalon is a good place to do that. Situated on a sea cliff, it is protected on only one side by the massive curtain wall. The other three sides are protected by the sea. The castle was built in the 14th century by William Douglas, 1st Earl of Douglas, and was built to impress. There is even a resident ghost to visit, it is said to be haunted by a courtly figure dressed in a ruff. Fife Balbrony Stone Circle While Balbrony House is now converted into a hotel, the park is still intact for exploration, though most of that is now golf course. Part of the park was also mined for coal at one point. The real feature is the stone circle, dating to before 2000 BCE. 
There are eight stones in a partial circle, as well as some gaps where stones may have been removed. Some of the stones have cut marks and rings carved into them. No one is certain what these markings mean, or who made them, but they are common in Scottish megalithic structures. The center of the circle has a rough, square flat area with low curb stones and filled in with flat paving stones. Nearby are a couple of cysts, or burial plots, lined with stones. Excavations took place in the 1880s and again in the 1970s, where a number of items were recovered, including an intact food container, a flint knife, and glass beads and buttons. Burnt Island Church This is a very unusual church, being built in a square plan, the nave surrounded by four aisles. The structure is supported by four huge stone columns, one at each corner. There is an ornate magistrate's pew was created in 1606, and the church has many references to the sea, anchors, ships, and other nautical emblems. The East Gallery is called the Sailor's Loft and had a separate entrance and external stairs. This allowed sailors, who had to catch the tide, to leave the church quietly. This is also the church in which the commission to create a new translation of the Bible was made by James VI of Scotland, later to become James I of England. That became the authorized version, or better known today as the King James Bible, giving the church its nickname, Church of the Bible. Kilross Palace and Abbey As you pass the rather industrial outskirts of Kilross Town, you may not realize what a treat you are in for. Kulross is like a time capsule to the 16th century, and as thus is used for a lot of filming. The National Trust of Scotland has done a lot of work making this town frozen in time. There is an extensive hanging herb garden, the remains of the abbey, a 1626 townhouse, and the narrow winds, narrow lanes, which run through the streets. The palace itself dates from 1597 and is restored to its mustard yellow color. The village itself was formed due to religion, coal mining, and salt. It was thought to be the birthplace of St. Mungo, and thus an abbey was formed in 1217. Though it has fallen to decay, the abbey church still works as the parish church. The heat from the coal helped the salt industry and the profits from the salt helped to build the palace. Falkland and Falkland Palace in 1970, Falkland was made into Scotland's first conservation area, and it maintains its nostalgic charm as a result. Cobbled winds and charming shops are at every turn in the village, while the palace looms in the south. Besides the town itself, Falkland Palace is a striking two-towered gatehouse, with a lovely parish church near the town centre. There has been a structure in this spot since at least the 1300s when Robert Stewart, Duke of Albany, made his home there. There are several highlights to see in the palace, including the panel keeper's quarters east of the gatehouse, the king's and queen's rooms, the old library and the bacon house. The chapel royal is exquisite, with detailed decorations on the ceiling and a tapestry corridor nearby that is not to be missed. Extensive gardens, water lily ponds, glass houses and Britain's oldest tennis court complete the visit. Secret Nuclear Bunker this is a great place to visit in poor weather and can keep the kids entertained. The irony is all the signs pointing at Scotland's secret bunker. Located in Anstruther, there is a long, sloping tunnel leading down into the paranoid world of the Cold War. It was built in the 1950s for government officials in event of an emergency. There is a cold, creepy feeling inside, as if you can hear the ghosts of those who had inhabited it during that time. It has dormitories, a Royal Air Force control room, and a telephone switchboard with 2,800 outside lines. There is also a BBC sound studio for broadcasting from within. Inverness Shire Isle of Harris The Golden Road This road is located north of Rodell on the way to Tarbert, on the south end of Harris. It was named the Golden Road due to how much it cost to build in 1897. It's not for the faint of heart. Much of the 10-mile road is single lane, winding and twisting across a seemingly barren landscape, with no shoulder or leeway for any mistakes. This road runs through South Harris in an area called the Bays, traveling through the coastal townships of Linger Bay, Finns Bay, 
Ardve, Flotabe, Maniche, Geocrab, and Lickisto. Luskin Tire Beach On the southwest tip of the Isle of Harris is the wonderful Luskin Tire Beach. Even with a dark, overcast sky, the waters are a bright aquamarine, and the sand is creamy white and pristine, fine, and smooth. This beach looks like a postcard out of some Caribbean vacation spot, so out of place on this northern, rainy, windswept location. The bay is like a shining jewel set in pale, blonde gold. Isle of Skye Armadale Castle Gardens This impressive country house, part of the Clan Donald, stands in some ruin in the south end of the Isle of Skye. It was built circa 1790 and was partly destroyed in a fire. It was rebuilt in 1815 in the Scottish baronial style mock Gothic. Don't miss the impressive ivy-covered main entrance to the Gothic wing or the imperial staircase. The 40 acres of formal gardens are well-maintained and include the rockery and ornamental ponds. The Museum of the Isles is part of the Clan Donald Centre. It looks a bit forbidding, but has a wealth of information inside. It is located just three-quarters of a mile from the Malague Ferry Terminal. There is also a restaurant and gift shop on property. Clatch Ard It is rare to find a Pictish symbol stone on the Isle of Skye. Of the 242 Pictish stones in Scotland, they are mostly on the eastern side of the country. This one is near the town of Tote, about five miles northwest of Portree. Clatchard means tall stone in Gaelic, and it's about five feet in height. It was discovered as a door jam in a nearby cottage when they were demolishing it. No one is sure what the symbols on the stone mean, though some have suggested they are dynastic symbols. Colbost Croft Museum This traditional Croft cottage depicts island life in the 19th century. It has an open hearth in the center of the floor for a peat fire and has two main rooms, a kitchen-slash-sitting room and a bedroom. There is a bare earth floor and unadorned dry stone walls. The amenities are very basic but would have kept the family snug during the worst sky winter, especially with the livestock in the cottage with them. There are outbuildings as well, one for storage and one for an illicit still, also good for keeping the family snug during the winter. Just next door is the Three Chimneys Restaurant. Dewarinish Peninsula While Skye is a frequently visited part of Scotland, with good reason, few tourists make it out to Dewarinish Peninsula in the northwest. It has some interesting geological features, such as the flat-topped mountains of Healable Moor, known as MacLeod's Tables. Off the west coast are three sea stacks, and Dove Scare, and Stack and MacLeod's Maidens. If you're visiting the Colbost Croft Museum, it would be worth your time to see this peninsula. Dunvegan Castle, home of the Clan MacLeod, lies just inside the east shore of the peninsula and has fantastically extensive gardens. Dunbeeg Brock Located on the west coast of Skye, at Brackadale, this brock stands on a hillside with great views over Loch Brackadale. The brock rises to about 14 yards and is a well-preserved structure. Be careful when climbing, though, parts are steep and covered in grass, which will be slippery, especially on damp days. The steps and stonework are impressive, especially considering it was likely built about 2,000 years ago. It does tax the imagination a bit to picture what life was like in these brocks, and indeed, it may be they were simply used in times requiring fortifications, but brocks dot the countryside all over the north of Scotland. Originally, this one was probably about 11 yards higher than it is today and roofed with wood and thatch. Duntulm Castle Little more than a rambling ruin today, this precariously perched 14th-century castle was once a mighty fortification on the north tip of the Isle of Skye. Its original name was Dundapid, or David's Fort, and was built at a time when the ruling Macdonalds were feuding with the Macleods. By the 16th century, castle defenses had been improved, but by the 17th century, the Macdonalds had taken possession of the castle. Within a hundred years, though, the castle was abandoned when Sir Alexander Macdonald built a modern home, Monkstad House, and used stone from the castle in the process. In its day, this location, 
perched on the edge of rolling hills, was an incredibly defensible spot. Follow the paths through the bits of stone wall with care and stay within its confines for your safety. In the rain, the stones will be slick, combine this with sheep droppings, and you get very difficult footing. At the entrance to the site, there is a cairn. It commemorates the MacArthas, traditional pipers to the MacDonald clan. Dunvegan Castle Dunvegan Castle has been the home to the MacLeod clan for at least 800 years and is an imposing stronghold on the Isle of Skye. It is impressive even today, with extensive renovations inside and both formal and rambling wild gardens outside. The buildings and the castle itself have been built during ten distinct periods, beginning with the Norse Leod Olufsen, born around 1200. It is likely there was a previous fortification on the headland, perhaps back to Iron Age times. The only entrance to the first castle was via the still-existing sea gate. A mystical legend says that an artifact on display, the fairy flag, was once the shawl of a fairy woman. She was the wife of one of the MacLeod clan who lived at the castle, and the flag is said to have magical properties. To fly the flag was to win the battle being fought, and it could be used three times. It has supposedly been used twice, successfully. While the flag on display is little more than scraps of silk, you can use your imagination to think of what it could have been in the fairy realm. As lovely as the castle was, the gardens were fantastic. They were wild and wandering, filled with flowers and foliage, bamboo and butterflies. We walked up to the waterfall, to the walled garden, and all around the pathways. The sheer variety and beauty of the flowers was almost overwhelming. We even saw a bright colony of mushrooms growing in the knot of a tree, protected from vandals by some mesh screen, sad, isn't it? I felt like Alice in Wonderland, seeing plants I'd never seen before. I expected a caterpillar to be around every bend, smoking his hookah. The Fairy Glen Just behind the Uig Hotel, which is on the south edge of Uig Village, there is a small road that will take you to the Glen. And yes, it is a very small and winding road, but you will get there. The Fairy Glen is an area you really have to see to believe. Covering over three and a half acres, it is strange and alien, with conical hills, rambling trees with exposed roots, and a rocky outcropping known as Castle Ewan. And it is green, simply everywhere. There is a small circle of stones laid out in a spiral, and legend says wishes are granted to girls who dance naked among them. There is narrow path up the hill, be sure to go all the way up to enjoy the view. And don't miss the disappearing stream which flows through this little valley and disappears into the hillside. The Fairy Pools Located in Glen Brittle, the Fairy Pools are a short walk from the nearby parking lot, near the Sligacan Hotel, and are several aqua blue pools. There are several waterfalls, an underwater arch in the river, and a well-made path along the left of the stream. Many pictures on the internet are mislabeled, one famously with purple flowers along aqua pools, which is really from New Zealand, so make sure you know what you are really looking for. Giant Angus McCaskill Museum The real Angus McCaskill was 7 feet 9 inches tall and weighed 500 pounds. He was listed in the Guinness Book of World Records as the tallest natural giant in the world until at least the 1980s. He was a member of P.T. Barnum's famous circus and could lift 350-pound barrels under each arm without effort. He was forced to move with his family to Cape Breton, Canada, where he grew tall and strong, and many stories of his strength have risen around his legend. After his work in the circus, he retired a wealthy man, but died soon after. Though McCaskill never lived on Skye, this thatched home museum was created in his memory by a relative. Kilmere Graveyard and Easter Church This graveyard is like an all-stars graveyard. The pride of place belongs to the grave of Flora MacDonald, the woman who smuggled Bonnie Prince Charlie out of Scotland dressed as her lady's maid. Known as preserver of Prince Charles Edward Stuart, she's said to have been buried in a shroud made from a bedsheet belonging to and slept in by Bonnie Prince Charlie himself. 
At her burial in 1790, some 3,000 mourners are said to have attended and consumed over 300 gallons of whiskey. Songs and tales have sprung up about this apocryphal tale, but no one knows the truth of it. Other notables include Fashion designer Alexander McQueen, his grave marker was purposefully designed and placed to look like an ancient monument. Dr. John McLean, this is a large burial enclosure with the inscription, sacred to the memory of Johannes McLean who being as distinguished in medicine as he was loved for his high principle pleasant manner and sound judgment died lamented by all on May 1, 1793 aged 85. Angus Martin, in Scots Gaelic, Aongas na Geoith. Angus of the Wind. He earned this nickname because he was known to go to sea, no matter the weather. His grave slab is carved with his full effigy. Charles MacArthur, the last hereditary piper of the MacDonald clan of Dunton Castle. His grave slab bears an incomplete inscription, here lie the remains of Charles MacArthur whose fame as an honest man and remarkable piper will survive this generation for his manners were easy and regular as his music and the melody of his fingers will, it's said that Charles's son had commissioned the marker, but when he was drowned at sea, the stonemason figured he'd never be paid so never completed the work. The place has a commanding view across the Minch to Harris and North Uist. Parts of the Easter Church date back to the 1100s, but most is from the 1798 rebuilding. Kilt Rock and Waterfall Kilt Rock is beautiful and made more so when the sun is hitting it. This is an easy one to get to, as there is a large parking lot just off the main road on the Trotternish Peninsula, and a huge observation deck to see the rock and top of the waterfall beside Loch Melt. The steel safety railings are hollow, and either by design or by accident, there are no caps on the ends of the railings. This means that, when the wind blows in the right direction, an eerie wailing can be heard, voices of the fae from the other side of the veil. The fall is the result of overflow from Loch Melt into the sea. Knock Castle This 15th-century castle on the east coast of Sleet on Skye is in ruins. Built by the MacLeods and captured by the MacDonalds, it is reportedly haunted by the Green Lady, a Gruagach, a ghost who is associated with the fortunes of the family who occupies the castle. If good news is to come, the ghost will appear happy. However, if bad news is to come, she will be weeping. The castle is also said to have a Glaistig, a spirit who cares for livestock. In order to see the castle, you must park and walk along a narrow minor trail, past a farm building. You will pass what is thought to have been a blacksmith's forge. Use caution, as the site is not maintained and can be slippery in the rain. Lighthouse at Erd of Sleet While it is a bit of a trek to make it to the southernmost point of the Isle of Skye, the views are well worth the effort. There is a single track road to the small village of Aird, and the lighthouse itself is not up high. But from this vantage point, you can see the islands of Eig and Rum, the Ardner Merchant Peninsula, and the Silver Sands of Morar. While the highest point of the area, 900 feet, is inaccessible, you will still see delightful visions along the road. There isn't much in the way of visitor attractions here, but the old Aird church has been converted into a small art gallery. Check the weather before making the journey, as the views will be limited with cloud cover or rain, but if you've a sunny day to explore, it's well worth it. The Old Man of Store This pointy rock outcropping is the result of ancient landslips. The area is dramatic and well worth a trek up the forest path. While you may feel like you are traveling back in time through this primeval wood, you will eventually emerge at the top of the hills and, if the mist parts enough to permit it, you will see the unusual rock formations of this spectacular site. There are three stages to this walk, but don't worry, the path is well marked. Once you park your car, head through the gate and follow the path curving up the hill. And yes, it will likely be mud, as the mists rarely leave the forest. The second stage is once you clear the forest and have a gravel path to follow. Go through a gate and up the slope to another path. It will get rough and rocky here, so take plenty of breaks. When the path splits, take the left branch. The third stage is after the split. 
There are some rough steps, and the old man will be on your far right side. The path continues to turn right and face the old man. Shilister Dai and Yarn Shop and Skyas Kyns. These two shops, located not far from the ruined Trumpen Church, are lovely little cottage industries, literally, run by locals. The dye and yarn shop has both raw materials and finished wool and yarn to purchase, and she uses mostly local flora and materials for her dye lots. She will take you on a short tour of her workshop to see the various processes. Shilister sells yarns internationally in local yarn shops all over the world. The Sky SKYNS Leather Tannery nearby also has a workshop tour, and the shop is in the loft of the Great Barn, with all sorts of colors and textures. Sky Supinterium Founded in 1991 in Broadford, this exhibition and educational center has become a haven for unwanted and illegally imported reptiles. They have helped over 600 creatures, and more than 50 are on display in the Supinterium, from white tree frogs to green iguanas. Staffen Beach. This black rock volcanic beach isn't just black, it's green and gold, black and gray, brown, and purple. The colors of the seaweed, lichen, and rock combine for an oil painting rainbow. However, do be warned, the single track road to get down there has very little by way of shoulder if someone is coming the other way. Check the track before you start down on it. From the level of the beach, you can see up into the quarrying. There are spectacular rock formations in that area, such as the prison, the needle, and the table. The best part is you can see real dinosaur footprints along the beach, dating from 165 million years ago. Trumpen Church On the Waternish Peninsula of Skye, this ruined church overlooks the sea. It was originally known as Silconane, or St. Conan's Church, and probably dates from the 1300s. A striking grave marker at the east end has the carving of a claymore surrounded by plants and animals. A nearby cave was the scene of a massacre of almost 400 of the MacDonalds by their rivals, the MacLeods. Revenge came quickly, while the MacLeods were in church at Trumpen, and set the church ablaze. The only MacLeod to escape the fire was a young girl who squeezed through a window. The church has been a ruin ever since. Other Isles Callum's Road This very hidden place is simply a road, built by determination and simple tools. Malcolm MacLeod, Callum in Gaelic, was a crofter who lived on the north end of the island of Raysay, near Skye. Many others also lived on the north end of the island and had to either walk several miles from where the road ended to their houses or take a ferry from Portree. Callum worked at the Rona Lighthouse and was a postman, and he campaigned for the access path to be made into a road. He was denied, so in the mid-1960s, he decided to build the road himself, using a shovel, pick, a wheelbarrow, and a book on road-making. Of course, the irony was that he never drove south, because he never got a driver's license. Capper Cayley wrote a song in his honor on their album, The Blood is Strong, and a book of his story came out in 2006. Silbara Also known as Kilbar Church this collection of structures includes a medieval church and two chapels, all set within the Yaligari burial grounds. The original church dates from the 1100s and might have had an earlier chapel dating back to the 600s, and is dedicated to St. Finbar of Cork, Ireland. The Kilbar stone has some complex Christian Nordic runic carvings on it and the relief of a cross, and probably dates from the 900s. The original cross is in the National Museum of Scotland, but a replica is available at Silbara. Among the graves is that of Sir Compton Mackenzie, author of Whiskey Galore and Monarch of the Glen. There are also some magnificent views of sandy beaches from the church. Mainland Inverness Shire Ardvariki Estate. This magnificent turreted highland estate was the setting of the show Monarch of the Glen. It is set within a magnificent glen on a promontory overlooking King Fergus's island. The three mile driveway winds past a huge inland beach and around the loch. While the main house remains a private home, the small gatehouse, also featured in Monarch, is available as a self catering rental. 
and the estate is host to many activities, such as deer stalking, golf, fishing, and water sports, as well as hiking, birdwatching, and scenic spots for photography. Boli Priory this ruined priory was a Valascalian monastery, established in 1230, possibly founded by Alexander II of Scotland, and supported itself by making salt. The order was eventually absorbed by the Cistercians in the 18th century. This priory houses some magnificent funereal sculpture, such as the monument to Prior Alexander Mackenzie, died in 1479, and Kenneth Mackenzie of Kintail, died in 1492, Highland chief and head of the clan Mackenzie, and nicknamed Coinich Abler or Kenneth of the Battle. Boli comes from the French name, Beaulieu, or Beautiful Place. It is mentioned in John Keats' poem, On Some Skulls in Boli Abbey, near Inverness. You may find the priory locked. If so, there should be a sign telling you where the key is, usually at the priory hotel in Boli Town. Caledonian Canal Built in the 19th century as a way to being much-needed work into the highlands after the Highland Clernaces, this great canal that runs for 60 miles along the Great Glen and bisects Scotland from Fort William to Inverness. There are 29 working locks along the route, as well as several large locks, don't get confused. Anyone with an interest in engineering or transportation will be fascinated by the mechanics of the system, first built in the early 19th century. You can sail through the canal or enjoy the view at Neptune's staircase, a ladder of eight locks that raises vessels to a height of 70 feet above sea level. This is also a great place to see Ben Nevis on a clear day. Carved Stones of Keel If you have a love for carved stone, this is a must-see for you. Originally called Kill Column Kill, or the Church of St. Columba of the Church, the Kiel Church was built on a site that was believed to be the site where Street Columba first settled on a high promontory, overlooking the Sound of Mole and Loch Aleen. The building itself was built in the 19th century and is very attractive with red stone and white harled walls. However, the stones it houses are the most interesting feature. Some date from the 700s, others are from the 14th or 16th centuries. There are various styles, from relatively simple to highly complex. Images of traditional West Highland ships, called Berlins, adorn two of the stones. Some stones have been recarved, the original carvings under the newer ones. You will find some skull and bones carvings, these are not indications of pirates, but a reminder in an illiterate age that death comes to us all. Coromoni Cairn About eight miles from Drumnadricate, this cairn is unusually well preserved, with eleven standing stones and a corbelled roof. It is accessible via a footbridge over a small stream. The cairn itself is about sixty feet in diameter and is well defined. There is a circular chamber in the center, reached via a low passage, which requires crawling to enter. There are a number of cut marks in the capstone, which lies to one side. It is believed that this site dates to about 4,000 years ago and may have been the burial place of a high-status woman, assumed by a bone pin found during excavation. Glenfinnan Monument and Aqueduct At the head of Loch Shiel, this place would be worth a visit just for the beauty. However, if you are interested either in Jacobite history or Harry Potter, there are other reasons to visit. Glenfinnan Monument was built to commemorate the place Bonnie Prince Charlie first raised his standard in 1745 to start the Jacobite Rising of that year, which ended horribly in Culloden in 1746. The viaduct behind it has been featured in each of the Harry Potter films as part of the Hogwarts Express route and is made up of 21 arches, up to 100 feet high. When it was first proposed, it was feared to be a monstrosity, an ugly clunking thing that would rob the area of its charm and beauty. Few would agree now, however, as it lends grace and nostalgia to the surrounding countryside. Just west of the viaduct is Glenfinnan Station, converted into a railway museum. You can explore a sleeping car and a dining car, complete with a veranda overlooking the valley. Highland Wildlife Park Opened in 1972, this is a 260-acre safari-style park where you can see native species of the highlands. 
visitors can see wolves, elk, yak, palace cats, vicuna, cranes, snow and great gray owls, and musk ox, as well as deer, reindeer, and red pandas. Recently some exotic, endangered species have been added to the animals on offer, to the tune of much controversy. It is open every day of the year, weather permitting, so it makes a great option if you have restless children tired of more castles or abbeys. Rogi Falls We came across this place by accident on our first trip to Scotland. Just past Strathpeffer, there is a wonderful forest walk and this odd waterfall where all the rocks are diagonal. It almost makes you feel as if you have vertigo, because you know you are standing straight, but everything else seems askew. In reality, this geological formation is due to plate tectonics. The forest itself is delightfully green and verdant, and there is a small bridge over the falls where you can continue the forest path on the opposite side. The small bridge and waterfall is perhaps one half mile down from the parking lot, and not a very difficult walk. Silver Sands of Morar while the road to the Silver Sands is memorable for its twists, turns, and stretches of single track, the incredible and remarkable part is the Silver Sands Beach. This white sandy beach offers sublime views across to the islands of Rum and Aig, as well as Sky. There are a number of places to park and explore the beaches and islets along the area. We truly felt as if we could be somewhere in the Caribbean islands with this lovely fine, white sand. The film Local Hero was shot near here. Sand dunes and sailboats can make for a relaxing afternoon picnic. Treasures of the Earth Are the children clamoring for something cool to do? For miles from Korpak in the West Highlands, this museum holds Europe's best collection of crystals, gemstones, and fossils. It is housed in simulated caverns, with crystals over a yard tall and geodes over seven feet tall. You can see the largest gold nugget ever discovered in the history of the Scottish gold rush, amethyst geodes that reach seven feet tall, and sparkling gemstones at every turn. Fossils from a billion years ago and petrified amber vi with the life-sized T-Rex skull for attention.